Hey guys, and welcome back to part 5 of the Francis Guide. Last time we left off on... Where did we leave off? We left at... Oh, we did uh, cardiovascular and neurological. So now we go to the next major system, which is pulmonary. So number one, it is an ex this is an extremely common question on the board exam. I had it. Looks like Francis had it as well. I, From reading the boards, a lot of people have this same question. So this is one to star highlight. You will probably get this one. So uh, the question is, a patient has this x-ray and it appears that they may have swallowed a coin. How do you get it out? So let's see if we can expand this a little bit get a better view because on the exam when you hit the the x-ray you it will actually expand it out if you need to look at it so again if you're not comfortable with x-rays I have uh, on previous videos I've uh, listed a link to my how to read a portable chest x-ray class it's about an hour but it's a good one we go through a lot of this stuff but anyway, so when we look at this chest x-ray, this is an AP view, looks like a child. Looks like they have a very white object right on the right in their throat, above the carina. So the carina is here where we get the right and the left main stem bronchus. And then right above that, there is this flat disc. And on the side, we got a flat disc. So this is a child that has, swoll that has swallowed a coin. And what's the best way to get this out? The answer is going to be bronchoscopy. So typically, if someone has swallowed something or you suspect a foreign object, the best way to get it out is with a bronchoscopy. If you guys aren't familiar with bronchoscopy, it's basically an endoscopy for your lungs. You take a similar tube, it's a little bit smaller, give you some Versed, make you very sleepy, put this uh, endoscope down your uh, bronchus or your, down your trachea and they look for stuff and this would be something very easy to take out. There's a little grabbing tool at the end. They can just snag that and pull it right on out. Not a big deal, but it is something to know. All right, next one. Patient has a gunshot chest wound. What kind of dressing does he need? So this is one where I guess someone comes in emergently and you're waiting for a uh, chest tube kit to be placed, but you have this sucking chest wound that you need to fix. The answer is a three-sided dressing, and for those who are unfamiliar with the three-sided dressing, this is it. I was actually unfamiliar with it until I came across this in the Francis Guide, and actually I got I got tested on this as well. So it's a good thing that I looked. So basically you just take a piece of Tegaderm on the non-sticky side, because we, want, we, want, we don't want this to be sealed across all sides. We want a, the non-sticky side of Tegaderm down. Or basically don't, don't even, well, yeah, just, just keep the sticky side up and then secure it all the way around on the four corners. One, two, three corners are secured with this fourth corner loose. And what happens is when the patient sucks in, it'll seal up and we can't get gas in. But when they exhale, gas can come out. That's actually a pretty cool trick. I don't work trauma, so I thought that was pretty neat. Uh, but that is what a three-sided occlusive dressing is. You just need something very thin like a piece of saran wrap. So like I said, Tegaderm will do. Just tack it down on three sides and you got a, at least a temporary treatment for a sucking chest wound. So that's pretty neat. Um, yeah, on my examination, I got a, it was just, a, I had a picture of a chest and it looked like there was a small round wound on the side of the chest. And it says, what kind of dressing would you use to treat this? And the answer was three-sided dressing. Uh, let's see. Number three. Patient is three days post-appendectomy. Develops dysphagia, drooling, and expiratory strider. What's going on? All right. So whenever... So the appendectomy is a distractor. Again, Frances doesn't go into a lot of detail on this. She just says there's a lot of distracting information. So basically, anytime that you have a patient that is post surgery so they had some trauma done to their throat you know they had the ET tube placed and then all of a sudden they they looks like they can't swallow hence the dysphagia the drooling and then the expiratory strider is also another clue you get expiratory strider when you have a narrowing 
of your soft palate. So in the back of your throat, if you're starting to swell up, you have a very narrow uh, tube to get air in and out, and when it narrows like that, it will whistle. And when you're listening for expiratory stride, you put your stethoscope on the neck and you can hear a whistling, usually both inspiratory and expiratory. Not just expiratory wheezes, which you'll see like in an asthmatic patient. And with an asthmatic patient, you'll hear it more in the chest. With the expiratory strider, you'll hear it in the throat. And so you're thinking, patient got an ET tube placed. It might, may have been a traumatic intubation of some sort. And now they're developing some swelling after the tube was taken out and they can't swallow and they got epiglottitis. So their vocal cords got inflamed and they can't speak, they can't swallow, and having a lot of issues. Uh, next one, number four. Patient is ventilated and comes in with arm edema. What low cost test do you order? Okay, uh, so anytime someone comes in with upper extremity edema, we think, what could it be? Of course, the main thing we think about is a blood clot. Could be other things, but usually I get this call all the time for the nurses. Someone's got upper extremity edema, just unilateral. And the easiest way to, remember, we always look for quick and easy. Quick and easy for this person is an ultrasound. Okay, other differentials could be a PE. All right. So, you know, a D-dimer is not always specific for a PE, so basically not everyone with an elevated D-dimer has a PE, so that's not a confirmatory test. A VQ scan, yeah, you could look for a PE there, but this patient's ventilated, so it's kind of hard to get a VQ scan on a ventilated patient. So again, we look for quick and easy for this person would be an ultrasound of that extremity, see if they have a clot. If they have a clot, we can consider they may have a PE. Either way, if, they, if it's just a uh, DVT of the upper extremity or a PE, we would order heparin or some other anticoagulant that would be appropriate. All right, next one, patient with ventilator system pneum associated pneumonia is on broad spectrum coverage, including Leviquin, Cefepime, and Vanco. Your culture comes back growing pseudomonas. What do you know, or what, what do you do now? Okay, so we need to know what each antibiotic covers. Okay, so when someone comes in with a ventilator associated pneumonia, you start them out with broad coverage antibiotics and you narrow it up as you get cultures. Okay, Pseudomonas is a common organism seen in pneumonia. Pseudomonas is known for being a gram negative rod. Okay, so let's look at our antibiotics. Leviquin. It's a fluoroquinolone. It covers both gram positive and gram negative antib uh, antib uh, antibody or not antibodies, bacteria, excuse me. Uh, cefepime, I believe that is a second or third generation cephalosporin. That covers both gram positive and gram negative. Whenever you treat pseudomonas, you always want to usually you want to have double gram negative coverage. So you want to have two antibiotics developing the gram negative coverage, so it attacks it in two different ways. Because pseudomonas is kind of a bitch to get rid of, so you, you give them both. Vancomycin only covers gram positive, so that's your MRSA. If this patient doesn't have MRSA, they got pseudomonas, so that would be the one to get rid of. Okay, number six, which of the following does not cause hypoxemia? Hyperventilation, hypoventilation, decreased atmospheric O2, and right to left shunt. Okay, so let's look at all of these. Uh, hypoventilation, we're not breathing very deeply, so we're not getting a lot of oxygen molecules in, so that will cause hypoxia. Decreased atmospheric O2, the partial pressure of oxygen in a higher environment, like if you go from Florida to Denver, you're going to have a noticeable decrease in the concentration of oxygen in Denver than there is in Florida, so that can also cause hypoxia. Right to left shunt, if you're not familiar with the right to left shunt, that's where you have a hole in your septum of either your atrium or ventricle causing blood to pass from the right side of the heart to the left side of the heart and bypassing the lungs. Uh, that will cause hypoxia. So the only one that does not cause hypoxia is hyperventilation. You're breathing very rapidly, but of normal, you know, normal or maybe subnormal volumes, but you're breathing rapidly. You're getting enough oxygen in 
typically if you're if you're hypoxic you'll try you'll start breathing faster so that's the compensatory mechanism that does not cause hypoxemia number seven what is the initial finding in a pulmonary embolism so we have respiratory acidosis respiratory alkalosis metabolic acidosis metabolic alkalosis okay so remember pulmonary embolism we have a clot in our pulmonary tree is this going to be a respiratory issue or a metabolic issue so this will be a metabolic issue because we are having trouble getting gas in and out of our lungs because we have a clot in the circulatory system of our lungs so it's not going to be metabolic acidosis or alkalosis those things be caused like with a sepsis or a renal failure or something like that so now we have to think of is this going to be an acidosis or alkalosis so this is kind of a tricky one so so think about this so we're not so we have a PE we let's you know it's not let's just let's pretend for for the moment it's not a saddle PE let's pretend it's generally like affecting 40 percent of our lung so we're not getting as much blood we're not getting any blood flow to 40 percent of our lung and our oxygen level is not high because our gases aren't being exchanged right so we're going to have lower O2 but we're also going to have higher CO2 right so you think oh well maybe it's acidosis but think about it we're going to breathe what faster so we're, we're breathing faster and faster and faster to try to get our O's up so we're not trying to hold on to the co2 we're trying to expel it and i think that's where it's going for here is where we're going to be tachypnic because they have a pe so that's going to breathe off the co2 because we're trying to get more o2 in and i guess eventually we're going to wind our way over to a metabolic or excuse me, a respiratory alkalosis i know that was clear as mud it's not a very good question <laughs> to be honest with you Number eight, 32 year old male patient has a history of a mitral valve regurgitation and is complaining with wheezing with exercise. What is your order? Okay, so our responses could be PFT, pulmonary consult, steroids, or slow acting beta, beta agonist, the SABAS. So like Francis mentions here, the MVR is a distractor. Doesn't matter that they have mitral valve regurgitation. That can make them short of breath, yes, because it can put them into respiratory failure or, or, or um, pulmonary, excuse me, scratch that, pulmonary edema, congestive heart failure. But wheezing with exercise, that's more of an asthma sign, right? So as we exercise, we get, pulmon we get a pulmonary constriction. Our bronchioles are constricting. So we're thinking, so whenever you think of wheezing with exercise, we're thinking of asthma. So how do we confirm someone having asthma? So what do we order? We don't order meds before, before figuring out what they have, right? So we're not going to give steroids. Or we're not going to give our beta agonists because we don't know this person has asthma or not. So those two we can throw out right away. What we have left is pulmonary function tests or pulmonary consult. And what have we mentioned in the past about getting a consult when we don't have any information, it's a bad thing. So before we get a consult, we have to get some baseline information. So the correct answer is getting a pulmonary function test. And that's a test where they measure the capacity of your lungs and they can determine if you have asthma or not. So that would be the correct answer. Number nine, the mother of a 19-year-old Alice calls you about her daughter's asthma attack. She tells you that Alice has shortness of breath and can't fully complete her sentences. She adds that Alice's usual medication, albuterol, isn't working. Which of the following should the mother administer to treat Alice's asthma attack? All right, so the clue here is that you need to know the progression of how we treat asthma so you know we have mild moderate severe 
and the upward titration of medications. So, 19-year-old girl, shortness of breath, she's having an asthma attack right now. She's not in status, it doesn't sound like, but she's working at it. They give albuterol, which is, you know, the first thing that you give for treatment of asthma. The next step up, so that's our short-acting beta agonist. All right. What do we do next? All right, so let's look at the answers. So we have ipitropium bromide, okay, aqueous epinephrine, albuterol, or metaproteranol. Okay, so you got to know your endings. So all, like metoprolol, albuterol, metaproteranol, those are all beta blockers or, or, or have something to do with the beta system, okay? So albuterol is our short-acting beta agonist and metaproteranol is, is also a short-acting beta agonist. Those are just different, different types. So we're looking at the alls. Those are going to be our beta agonists. So semoterol is our long-acting beta agonist. So anytime it's O all, it's going to be beta. Okay, so these two are the same. So those can be tossed out. What do we have left? We have ipitropium bromide, which is our anticholinergic. And then we have aqueous epinephrine. Okay, so what happens the, in stepwise fashion, first we give the short-acting beta agonist, then we give the short-acting anticholinergics as the next step. So A would be the correct answer. Aqueous epinephrine, that's where you put uh, epinephrine in a handheld nebulizer and you have them inhale it. That is only used if patient is having status, asthmaticus. So that's where you hear expiratory wheezes up in the throat and they're extremely dysmic, like they're breathing 36 times a minute. The, you, they're about ready to crash. That's where you give them the aqueous epinephrine. So that's more of an emergency department medication. Remember, you're, you're talking about this over the phone. So the thing, you know, if she's just short of breath and having difficulty completing sentences, so she's not in status, but she needs something extra, it would be ipitropium bromide, the anticholinergic. The next step up would be the inhaled corticosteroids. So it'd be like your flow vent. And then the next step up would be the long acting beta agonists, like your, your um, Cerevent or Somoterol. Combine for Motorol, I mean, excuse me, Flovent and Cerevent together is Advair. And then the next thing would be like a Teotropium, which is your long acting anticholinergic. All right, number 10. 36 year old patient who has a history of asthma comes to the emergency department in a fatigued state. She has difficulty speaking due to respiratory distress, but is able to explain she is recovering from a cold but her signs and symptoms are so severe that she came into the emergency department. So her heart rate is 118. Her forced vital capacity, FEC, is within limits, I believe they're saying here. FEV1 is 45% of expected value. Okay, so FEV1 should be 80% or greater in a normal person. So this is low. You order albuterol as a nebulizer, but patient does not respond. Now what do you do? All right, so let's look at our choices. So basically it's asking, someone's coming in with respiratory distress from asthma. What do you give? So we have aqueous epinephrine. Now we discussed this before. This is an emergency department medication, okay, but used in status asthmaticus. So are, are they wheezy, 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 all up in their throat and looks like they're about ready to close off? Maybe. We'll keep that in the back of our head. Albuterol. We already gave that. Didn't work. Methylprednisone. So steroids. Possibility. And the last one is monoleucas or singular. That is a leukotriene modifier. That is a medicine that basically stops the uh, histamines from being released at, at a higher level than Benadryl. So this is a pill. This is something that is for for long, 
for, for maintenance of asthma, not as an acute treatment for asthma. So we can get rid of albuterol because we already used it. We can get rid of the monolucas or singular. Our last two, again, are aqueous epinephrine and methylprednisolone. So someone's in distress, but they're not wheezy. They're not, they're not in, having strider. Strider equals aqueous epinephrine. If they're just having a, an asthma attack, you give methylprednisolone. So that will decrease the inflammation of their bronchioles, allow them to breathe. That's the one to give. All right, next one. Patient with asthma has decreased breath sounds on presentation. You give a NEB treatment. Now her SATs are dropping. That's, that's awful. Uh, SATs are now decreased to 86% and there are no breath sounds. What do you do? Okay. So we know this patient has asthma. They have poor breath sounds on presentation. We treat them with albuterol, with a NEB, and they're not responding and actually deteriorating. What do we do? All right, so let's look at our choices. Nebulizer, ABG, epinephrine. This is an aqueous epinephrine. This is just give them a shot of that. Be like they're having an allergic reaction or intubate. Okay, so stat nebulizer. Nope, we already did that. ABG. This patient's dropping like a stone. We don't have time to wait for the ABG because an ABG is going to take 10 to 15 minutes to come back. So, and all the ABG is going to say is that, hey, she's in respiratory distress. We know that already. We don't need to get that. Epinephrine, maybe if she's having an allergic reaction, but we don't know. Okay, that might work. But again, how long is it going to take to get the epi out, get the IV in, blah, 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 and hope that it works. This, this person is having respiratory distress and is sinking in front of your eyes. You need to intubate. When she intubates, then you can get a higher level of O2s down the lungs and her SATs will bump up. That buys you time to get steroids in her. Uh, if you feel it's from allergic reaction, you can get then give IV epinephrine all you want. That's cool. But, you know, when it comes to ED medicine, it's always ABC, airway, breathing, circulation. We're losing our airway. She's not breathing well. We have to do something emergent. That's intubate. Number 12, a 51-year-old male is admitted to the emergency department with severe dyspnea. Patient's history indicates emphysema. The nurse practitioner orders oxygen. Since the SAT dropped from 96 to 90 over the course of, I'm assuming, an hour. However, the NP also advises the attending nurse to continue monitoring the patient because A, he's lost his hypoxic respiratory drive, or B, he has lost his hypercapnic respiratory drive. All right. So remember that COPDers, or, or let's just say general people in general, what causes you to take a breath? Is it because you're hypoxic or is it because you're hypercapnic? Normally, people breathe because they're hypercapnic. You know, if, if you're retaining CO2, your body will tell you to breathe, breathe, breathe. Okay? Same thing with low, low hypoxia too. But in a COPD ear, they tend, their, their lungs aren't working as well. They are chronically hypercapnic. You know, in my end, when I used to work pulmonary, my end stage COPD ears, we call them, we just, we tell them that they're in the 50 50 club. Their PO2 is in the 50s and their PCO2 is in the 50s. And they're breathing just fine on that. Okay. Remember, a normal CO2 is what, 35 to 45. Their CO2 is chronically up. So, you know their body knows that when when they're CO, you know that they always have this chronically high CO2. They're not going to breathe deep, very deep because of it because it's always there. So they're they're more focused on the oxygen. Okay, so if we increase person's PO2 by giving them supplemental oxygen, then they're you know as they're getting more O2, they're not going to breathe as fast. Okay, and they're going to breathe slower. And because they're breathing slower, their PCO2 will rise even higher above that 50 that they normally sit at. So that can make people very uptunded and cause them to crap out, which would require an intubation. 
So just going down the down that road. But the main thing to remember is that anyone with COPD, they've lost that drive to take a deep breath because of chronically high PCO2. So B is a correct answer. All right, number 13. What is the earliest sign of pneumonia in an elderly patient? Shortness of breath, tachypnea, fever, hypoxia. This is not a very well-worded question if you ask me because in my mind dyspnea and tachypnea are very similar all right now remember that you know in elderly patients you know uh, they do not have as many signs and symptoms of pneumonia like a, a adult would you know a, a middle-aged or early aged adult would have in an early age adult they would become feverish uh, a lot of the times you see an elevated white cell count in the elderly, you don't really see that much. So we're looking at the earliest sign. So basically it's looking at what are we gonna see first? So we know fever is not it. So that one we can toss right away. So looking at this question, what it, again, the catch word is earliest sign. What's gonna happen first? Are they gonna complain about dyspnea first? Are they gonna be tachypnic first? Or are they gonna be hypoxic first? In my mind, an elderly patient is you're going to notice the tachypnea first so something that the patient won't notice you know hey you're breathing 26 times a minute are you feeling okay buddy and you know they say i'm feeling fine then i think that would be followed by some hypoxia and then dyspnea shortness of breath would probably be the answer there but remember they're again this is not the best worded question but they're what they're looking for is to trick you up what's the earliest sign so the earliest sign is always is in an elderly patient is usually going to be something that you see and not something that they'll perceive all right number 14 patient is a 79 year old male japanese immigrant what tb in duration measurement is diagnostic all right now when we're dealing with special populations some special populations have received the tb vaccine these populations are usually in Japan, parts of Asia, which is Japan, I know, uh, and also Africa. I think some Europeans do too, all right? So they've, they've already been exposed to tuberculosis through the immunization. So when you hit them with a PPD, they're they're going to have a bit more brisker response than someone who's never been exposed to it. Remember, if you've been exposed to it before, the red the red level is going to get worse. So in this gentleman, we're looking for eleven millimeters. So basically, the the higher the larger area of induration is going to be the correct one because this guy's already been exposed to TB probably through vaccination programs. So 11, meter, 11 millimeters or greater would be diagnostic for him. In a general population in the United States, it's going to be much smaller. Okay. Uh, number 15, your asthmatic patient is on a SABA, short-acting beta agonist, and inhaled corticosteroids, ICS. She has no secretions, but her symptoms are not well controlled. What do you order next? Okay, so this person probably already has rescue inhalers. Well, no, scratch that. I'll, question didn't say that, so let, let me, let's me let go through it again. So she's on short-acting beta agonist and inhaled corticosteroids. So short-acting beta agonist is albuterol, I'm sorry, that's so she's on a buterol and, and inhaled corticosteroids, so Flovent. Remember what we talked about with that young girl earlier? What, you know, about the levels of care when someone has asthma? Where is that question again? Bum, 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 bum. There we go. So Miss Alice, remember, she was only on a buterol, and our next step up was the epitropium bromide. Okay, so we will go from albuterol to combivent which is albuterol and epitropium bromide combined together. Okay, so you gotta know these levels of what to give when. So we start out with albuterol, then we increase to combivent or add epitropium bromide to it. 
Then we go to inhale corticosteroids. Okay. Then what's the next level? All right. So let's look. We have somoterol, which is a long-acting beta agonist. We have ipitropium, monolucast, or metaproteranol. Now, if you're not familiar with metaproteranol, remember we saw it before. Up here with Miss Alice, metaproteranol, the OL, is going to be beta agonist. We know that's a short-acting short one. Okay. So... Short acting mega agonist, we've already we're already giving that, so we can toss that one out. Monolucast. That is again a leukotriene modifier. It basically prevents uh, allergic reaction or dampens it down. That is an adjunct that we can give later on, okay, but not a primary mode of treatment on this on the scale. Okay. Uh epitropium bromide, that is a short acting and a cholinergic. So, yes, you could give this with the Saba and create Combavent. But again, these are rescue medications for when people get shorter breath. Here it says she has no secretions. Remember, epitropium bromide cuts down secretions. That's what the anticholinergic reaction is. You cannot make the mucus with epitropium bromide. So that's a clue there. So that gets this one out. But her symptoms are not well controlled. So the next thing we order is a combination of inhaled corticosteroids and a long-acting beta agonist, otherwise known as Advair. And that usually does well. Remember, you must, must give an inhaled corticosteroid before you start a long-acting beta agonist. That is a black box warning. Okay, that is a must. If you give some Motorol without an inhaled corticosteroid and the patient dies, that is a lawsuit. Do not do that, please. Okay, uh, but just, you, again, you got to remember the levels. Short-acting beta agonist, and then anticholinergic, and then you add uh, inhaled corticosteroids, and then you add long-acting beta agonists, and then you can add your adjuncts. After that, then we would think about the monolucast. Then, you know, if they're still difficult to control, we would do like a, a prednisone taper or something like that to get them out of their asthma attack. All right. What is paradoxical abdominal and diaphragmatic Movement. A. Symptoms of anxiety disorder. B. An ominous sign in asthma. C. Respiratory bacterial infection. I remember this from my FNP days when we're treating uh, asthmatics in clinic. If a kid, this, this is usually seen a lot in kids, if they're trying to breathe and you see their belly, like they're there's the, the, the kids sucking in and your gut will, will, will scooch in. So you're taking a breath and then your belly goes concave. And then you breathe out and then your belly starts fattening out again. And it goes like that. That's paradoxical diaphragmatic movement, abdominal diaphragmatic movement. That's telling me that you're trying to suck in with all your might, but you can't do it. It's creating a vacuum inside of your lungs. You know, you're trying to your, all your muscles are going into trying to inhale those lungs out, but you just can't get enough air in with the amount of force you're putting on. So it's so you're getting almost like a vacuum sucking in your gut while you're trying to breathe in. That's an ominous sign uh, in asthma and usually requires emergent intubation because they're not breathing well at all. So that would be a point to intubate. Next one, number 17. Which of the following is a reason to intubate an asthmatic patient? High respiratory rate, bad ABGs, low oxygen saturation, change in behavior. Okay, so all of these signs are, are signs of not oxygenating very well. Excuse me. Uh, so we have high respiratory rate, bad, uh, bad gases, low sats 
Okay, what can we do for A, B, and C? Give oxygen, give NEBS, give oxygen, give oxygen. Change in behavior. What they mean is, were you perky patient coming in, and now you're obtunded patient? If you're becoming obtunded and very sleepy, that tells me your CO2 is going up, and it tells me you're about ready to crash. That is a reason to intubate. All right, next one, number 18. What history do you ask about before you prescribe a sleep aid to your 69-year-old patient? All right. Um, I don't know what this means by SZ, maybe surgery. I don't know. Depression, heart disease, sleep apnea. So uh, if someone has sleep apnea, which is, of course, the, the correct answer, your airway is collapsing as you're sleeping at night you are waking up frequently throughout the night to be able to breathe. So you'll, you'll take a couple breaths, you settle down to sleep, your airway collapses, your body wakes yourself up, hey, I can't breathe. You put more tone into your upper pharynx, you're able to breathe a couple breaths, you fall asleep again, and the cycle continues and continues throughout the night. So they can't breathe or sleep very well at night, and they feel like crap in the morning, and then they ask, their doc, hey, can I have a sleep aid? Well, why aren't they sleeping very well? You should never really just pass out sleep aids just because. So for someone with sleep apnea, if you were to give them a sleep aid, so let's say you gave them Ambien, something not to do with someone over the age of 65, um, but let's say you did it anyway, you gave them Ambien, so you really snockered them out and now they're not waking up to breathe, what's going to happen? They're going to become hypoxic and hypercapnic, which can worsen their condition. So that is a thing to watch out for with sleep aids. Because remember, you're not sleeping well for a reason. What's that reason? All right, number 19. Your patient is a nurse with a positive PPD. Her chest x-ray becomes comes back negative. What do you do now? Uh, this is something just guys just have to look at is basically the um, TB guidelines um, for us. So she probably got exposed to TB in the workplace. You check an x-ray for a nodule in those upper apices. If you don't see it, they usually just give six, six months of INH and then they, and then they follow up to see if she has worsening symptoms or if, if things are looking better. And, that, and you guys are just going to have to look at the TB treatment list. It's very specialized, you know, and in fact, if you get a question, you're probably going to get one. So, you know, I, my, my main thoughts with studying for this test is that for some of these way out there questions like TB, you know, that, that really only ID and the health department deal with, don't waste your, you know, you know, glance over them, but don't spend hours and hours trying to remember which antibiotics are given when. Uh, it's, you know, it's 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 not worth your time. <laughs> to to be honest, I mean, miss missing a you know missing a question where you could be spending an hour studying something else. I know what I I would have done. So again, just be familiar with PPDs. You know, what what are positive, what are negatives in most people, and that'll get you through the test. Um, I guess just know if you um, you know have a PPD that's positive with a chest X-ray that's negative, you can give INH for six months, and that's cool. But we're really not going to ask which drugs to give a lot of the time for for TB. That's not a very frequently asked question in the inpatient setting. All right, uh, what natural measure is most important to prevent ventilator assisted associated pneumonia? Increase head of bed or frequent oral care? The answer is increase head of bed. Uh, ba, 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 ba. Let's see, chest x-ray. Again, I would advise you to look at my chest x-ray class if you guys are very unfamiliar with chest x-rays. Let's see what this one shows. So for this one, if you look here, you can see these lots of little curly cues in the lung fields 
here and there and there and everywhere that is a reticulated lung field meaning that they have you know all the little interstices are inflamed in the lung and you see this kind of curled q pattern that's that is diagnostic for a uh, pneumonitis i don't think you guys are going to get anything like that if you do i'd be very surprised uh, again the x-ray questions that i received on my examination is basically i had the coin question i believe you, you know i think we went over this in the gi if you see air you know air over the diaphragm you, that's more of a peritonitis kind of question um they're going to be extremely obvious the pneumonitis is not an obvious uh thing to see and can be very subjective you usually have to look at a pre you know like an older x-ray and this one and try to correlate it with the symptoms all right there's some sicker x-rays so this one right here we're seeing an air fluid level right there on the left lung we can see the costophrenic angle is is blunted we can also see this white haziness over here that's atelectasis so that's basically the fluid on the left lung uh, chamber pushing up on the lung causing atelectasis you can see the one on the right is mildly blunted as well here they're pointing out the curly B lines so you can see the pulmonary arteries here are very congested and you can see just this haze of pulmonary edema all throughout okay let's see what else here we go again PE causes respiratory alkalosis because they're breathing off all their CO2 because they're tachypnic they can't get enough oxygen um, <laughs> Someone with COPD, the best non-pharmacological treatment is BiPAPs. Remember that, you know, that when you have someone coming in with a COPD exacerbation, there is a stepwise uh, method to try to avoid intubation. You know, when they come in, shorter breath, you start them on oxygen, nebulizers, steroids, if they're not getting better and they're, they're, they're looking like they're hypercapnic, you can try BiPAP, which actually works very well, especially if their CO2 becomes back high. And then if that's not working, then you would proceed to intubation because we're trying to avoid intubation at all costs and on these COPD patients because they're very difficult to extubate. Um, I got this question on my exam. Patient has TB and lives with six other people. Do you treat the other six people or test them? Uh, or do you refer them to the health department you test them? Because uh, just because you live with someone doesn't mean that you're going to get it. Granted, being in close confines is going to make you more likely to have TB. But we want to confirm TB before we give them uh, antibiotics for six to 12 months. If someone has HIV and is positive for TB, what do you do? You give the maximum drug regimen because they're going to be very ineffective at fighting that off. And for TB, you have to culture times three with sputum cultures to uh, be diagnostic. Though you would also give a PPD, and if, that, if that's positive, that's also diagnostic as well. Um... <laughs> Well, that's about it. All right, next one, immunologic. Again, this is not one of my stronger ones. Well, let's go through it. Uh, patient needs to start treatment with a DMARD for rheumatoid arthritis, which is the least expensive. Okay, so we have Plaquenil, Sulfasalazine, Methotrexate, Lafutamide. Uh, the answer is methotrexate. Methotrexate has been around forever. It's kind of weird that, that the test would ask that question, to be honest with you, because how would you know? They're, these are all generic. Um, don't know, but the answer is methotrexate. Uh, next one, where are Bouchard's uh, nose located? So DIPs, distal, uh, inflanges. PIPs, proximal metaphalanges, MCPs, medial, uh, are the, the, the 
mid-carpal joints or the wrists. So remember, the Bouchards are the, are the PIPs, the Heberdens, the herbs you know, are the DIPs. That's where you, that's where you hold your herbs, is in, the, is in the distal part of your fingers. That's how you remember that. Number three, which is not a early sign of HIV AIDS. So remember, in the first few weeks, you'll have constitutional symptoms. If you can catch them early, you can possibly cure them by, with aggressive treatment. Um, so fatigue, vague abdominal pain, fever, weight loss, night sweats. Remember, these are all constitutional symptoms that we'll see with HIV AIDS. So we would, we would see fever, weight loss, night sweats in the first few weeks of having a, an acute HIV infection. Um, fatigue, vague abdominal pain is not a constitutional symptom. Which of the following patients is most likely to get HIV? Sex workers that doesn't use condoms. Uh, homosexual men who don't use condoms. Or IV drug use. IV drug use is the most likely, although all are at risk. Uh, ba -ba 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 -ba. Which of the following demonstrates the appearance of normal veins on a fundoscopic examination? Uh, if you go back and review th the pictures you see on a fundoscopic examination, the arteries are narrow and red. Uh, the veins are wider and less red. Patient has CMV. What is the appropriate treatment? So the question is, what is CMV? Cyclomegalovirus, V for virus. Which of these treat viruses? Cephalozoacin is a is a, um, is that camera, second or third degree, cephalosporin, cipro, is a fluoroquinolone, fluconazole, or gemcyclovir. Remember, IR is for virus. All right. Patient has rheumatoid or and steroids aren't working. What is your next step? You add a DMARD, which is a mexotrexate, ah, mexotrexate, excuse me. Patient stepped on a nail and doesn't know his tetanus status. Do you give just tetanus or Tdap? We always give the Tdap. Uh, which patient would sarcopenia be an expected finding? Elderly patient. Yeah, all right. All right, HIV testing. Remember, it's the first test is ELISA. Then you confirm with the Western blot. You don't, you know, you have HIV and AIDS. Age isn't until your CD4 count is less than 200 because 800 is normal. Or you have a viral load uh, of less than... Uh, I'm sorry, guys. I would just go by CD4. I, I, if your viral load is is high, that will also give, in, give a, an AIDS diagnosis. I don't know. I, this is not the right one. Why would the viral load be less than 5,000 be positive? Uh, it doesn't make a lot of sense. So you may want to review that. Uh, patient with petechiae and legs, bone marrow suppression, has leg weakness. What should you test for? Cyclomedic megalovirus, because that, that, remember, a virus will give you more of a diffuse rash. Um, ba -ba 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 -bum. Said Ray, look at me. I'm sorry, guys, I'm just going through these real quickly, see what's interesting. Fifty-one, fifty-seven-year-old patient with a history of cardiovascular disease complains of pain in both knees. That's progressively worse. So you're thinking osteoarthritis, right? What medication is contraindicated? Uh, basically, it's the COX-2 inhibitor, so Celebrex. Back when I first started out, you had the COX, the COX-2, so you had several of these. You had Celebrex, and then you had a couple other ones. Uh, don't remember their names anymore. Uh, basically, it doubled your risk of having an MI, so it went from 0.5% yearly to 1% yearly. So, as I told my patients, it's it's a matter of, you know, do you want to take the chance or not? And eventually, it just came out, they, you know, all these other COX-2s went off the market. The only one still left is the Celebrex. But it still has an increased risk of MI, so if someone has bad disease, you want to try something different. So, like an ibuprofen 
would be appropriate or Tylenol. Uh, what is associated with headache, fever, and an elevated sed rate, temporal arteritis? I remember there would probably be one or two temporal arteritis questions. Uh, and temporal arteritis is really easy once you know what it is, what you're looking for. Remember, you'll see people with a severe headache. They'll have this big throbbing artery on the right or left side of the head, depending on which artery is affected. Remember, it's a big inflammatory response or inflammation of the temporal artery. So they'll become very big, distended. They'll have a headache. And uh, because it's an inflammatory response, you're going to have elevated sed rate, which is a marker of inflammation, as well as a fever. This is one of those emergencies that has to be seen right away. You should take them to the emergency department if you're seeing them in the clinic or you see them in the ED. They need to be referred for uh, biopsy with ENT. All right. Uh, best way to check for glaucoma is with tonometry. Just remember that normal intraocular pressure is 10 to 20. That's how you know if it's working. If you're, if you're getting the drops and it's working, their IOP should drop back down to normal. Um, and that is about it. All right, guys, that's about an hour. So thank you for being with me. Next time we're going to hit critical care. We'll review uh, more ABG stuff, shock stuff, and uh, Swan Gans catheter readings. So I'll talk to you guys then. Take care.